practicing the biblical principles of what a church should be and manifesting the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the Hour of Faith, originating from the sanctuary of Faith Baptist Church, Altoona, Pennsylvania, 315 40th Street in the Highland Park section of the city. As you participate in today's broadcast, may the Lord challenge your heart with the Word. Welcome each and every one of you to the Sunday morning service coming to you directly from the Faith Baptist Church of Altoona, Pennsylvania, the United States of America, and wherever you might be today. We thank you so very, very much for the pleasure of your company. And I trust that you can sing as, as we just had the opportunity of singing, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Yours. Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Oh, I trust that you do. You know, that's the most important thing that anybody can do in life. And that is to realize that they are a sinner and that Jesus is the only Savior. And then to trust him to give them the forgiveness of sins and eternal life through faith in Christ alone. That's our prayer for you today. As a matter of fact, there's a verse of scripture that I would like to read to you. It's a verse that comes out of 2 Corinthians chapter 13. And it's verse 5 where it says, Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. Now somebody is probably going to challenge me for being not politically correct, but I want to ask you a personal question. Are you a reprobate? And you know, I would hear people say, well, a preacher shouldn't say that. Well, uh, preachers deliver the word of God. And sometimes, you know, we don't understand the full meaning of words. I mean, if somebody comes up to you and says, uh, you are a reprobate. Well, what does that really mean? You know, that's probably not nice to call somebody one. I'm just asking you if you are one. Listen to this verse again. Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. Do you know what a reprobate is? It's one who has been put to the test and found wanting. I I don't know about you, but you can all perhaps remember taking tests in school or uh, college or university, whatever the case may be. I remember one day I took a test and... uh, Because of the fact that I was away for the week that we uh, studied this particular subject. I was out deer hunting, as a matter of fact. The first day back, our Spanish teacher gave us a test, and I made a zero. A zero. I didn't get one right. And uh, I can remember my dad saying, you should have gotten better than that. I said, Dad, well, you took me deer hunting. (laughs) That didn't go over too well. But I was put to the test. And found wanting. And when it comes to salvation, this is a very very serious thing. He says, examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. Have you truly been saved? 
Can you find a time where having recognized that you were a sinner and that Jesus Christ was the only Savior and that you called upon his name saying, Lord Jesus, I trust you to save me. If you've never done that, I would encourage you to do it today. And then you can sing, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. If we can never serve you here spiritually, please don't hesitate to contact us. For those of you watching on TV and, and have a screen in front of you or the Internet or iTube or uh, Facebook, why you can see our information there. I would encourage you to contact us. For those of you listening by radio, the phone number is 814-944-2894. That's 814-944-2894. The website is www.fbcaltuna.org. And I would encourage you, please, to contact us if we can be of any spiritual blessing to you. Again, give us a call if you have a prayer request, a question about the Bible, 814-944-2894. And at our website, there is contact information there. That's www.fbcaltuna.org. We're going to sing another song that relates to our salvation. No matter what we go through as Christians, we know without a doubt that through faith in Christ, it is well with our soul in that we have that solid relationship with Christ. You all know that song, It Is Well With My Soul, without a doubt one of my very favorite songs. We're going to sing verses 1, 3, and 5 here today. And I trust that those of you at home or wherever you're watching or listening can say, it is well with my soul. It's hymn number 375, number 375, verses 1, 3, and 5, it is well with my soul. Let's stand as we sing. to be singing for us this morning. I have the 
blessed privilege of living where I can ride by this church every day. And so I often look out on the, on the marquee, on the sign, to see what it says. And um, this week I was driving by and it said, Jesus is the sweetest name I know. And I was telling some of the reverence members, I didn't know what I was going to sing today until I saw that sign. And I thought, that's what I'm going to sing. But when I started to think about the sweetness of his name, um, how it's so often in this world used in such a non-sweet way, um, and then this morning we heard Jesus Messiah. He's the name above all names. He's the blessed redeemer, and he's Lord of all. The name of Jesus is not only sweet, it's also powerful. Because scripture tells us that there's going to be a time when every knee shall bow. And every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. So he's sweet, but he's strong. And I just wanted to do two choruses on the sweet name of Jesus. Jesus is the sweetest name I know. And he's just the same as his lovely name and that's the reason why i love him so because jesus is still the sweetest name i know jesus Still the sweetest name I know. And he is just the same as his lovely name. And that's the reason why I love him so. Because Jesus He's still the sweetest name I know. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There's just something about that name. He's master and savior jesus he's like the fragrance after the rain jesus jesus let all heaven and earth proclaim that kings and their kingdoms, they will all pass away. But there is something about that name. For those kings and their kingdoms, they will all pass away. But there's something about that name for Jesus is still the sweetest name I know. Thank you. Amen. I know some of you already said it, but all of God's children say Amen. it is the sweetest name that there is. Thank you, Val Spann. We appreciate <clears throat> that ministry in song. This past week, one of God's choice servants went home to be with the Lord. It was Lila Winder. Lila and Stan Winder served the Lord for many, many years, and some of you know them and some of you don't know them. Uh, Stan Winder, <clears throat> I think, pastored three or four churches right here in the Altoona area, outside of the Altoona area. God used him in the Altoona Christian Counseling Center for many, many years, was a great servant of God. And when we go over to um, India in a couple of weeks, we are going over there to dedicate a building in his name, simply because of the fact that he had a burden for India 
I, as I understand it, had the desire at one point to go over to India to, to be a missionary, but because of physical reasons and health, he was unable to do so. So we put together a plaque, and we gave one to Lila. And if you were at the viewing the other day, you saw it there among the gatherings of the things that we had. And we're going to take one over. It's actually in my study now. <clears throat> and we're going to put it up there in honor of Stan and Lila Winder because of the love that they had for the Lord Jesus. And my heart was particularly blessed at the service the other day when, when family members stood up and, and gave testimony as to what Lila meant to them. She was a prayer warrior. Now, she would either call me or ask her son Tim to for me to call her so that I could pray with her because I did pray for her often. But you know what? She said she prayed for us every Sunday. She watched us on television every Sunday, and she prayed for us every Sunday. So we need somebody who's going to take Lila's place in praying for us as she's with the Lord. But at the funeral the other day, <clears throat> I was thinking about this whole concept of making a decision for Jesus Christ. Lila made that decision many years ago. My question is, have you made that decision for Christ? To, today, for just a few minutes, I want us to talk about conditions, choices, and consequences. Conditions, choices, and consequences. Remember that life is made up of conditions, choices, and consequences. Every life is made up of those three things. And as we face the conditions of life and make the right choices, we will reap the best of consequences. However, if we face the conditions of life and make the wrong choices, then we will reap the worst consequences. And I think that everyone under the sound of my voice today can associate with that. You can remember in the past of how many times you made the right choice facing certain conditions and the consequences were great blessings. On the other hand, you can probably remember times when you made the wrong choice in facing certain conditions and the consequences were anything but pleasant. And we can all associate with both of those concepts. Well, in dealing with our spiritual life, we would do well to recognize that there are certain conditions before us that require the right choices to be made in order for us to experience the right consequences. And so today, we're going to study a little bit about conditions, choices, and consequences as they relate to our relationship with God through Christ. Now, I want to say that this brief study is going to be one of the most basic studies you've ever heard in your life if you're a Christian. But if you're not a Christian, it may be one of the most beneficial studies you've ever heard. And so we want to focus on this today, conditions choices, and consequences. And as we do, I remind you that there are two conditions we face, two choices we face, and two consequences that we face as it relates to our spiritual life and our relationship with God. First of all, let's look at the two conditions. And I'd invite you to turn with me to the book of Ephesians, the second chapter. Ephesians chapter 2. And due to the nature of the message, I'm not going to be able to delve into any one of these passages to the degree that I should. But I'd like for you to, to take heed in your own study of the Word of God. Ephesians chapter 2 presents to us two conditions. Now, what are these two conditions? The first condition is the condition of being lost. The second condition is the condition of being saved. Verses 1 through 3 of Ephesians chapter 2 speaks of the condition of being lost. Notice what it says. He says, as Paul was speaking to the Ephesians who were saved at this point, he said, and you hath he quickened, that means made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past he walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. That really describes the condition of being lost. 
And in past, I've preached on this, and some of you may have my outline in your Bibles on these first three verses. Because it says, first of all, we are dead in our trespasses and sins, meaning separated from God at birth because of our sin. Then we are depraved because we are walking according to the course of this world. That means we are so lost we can't save ourselves. We are diabolical because before we are saved, we are walking according to the prince of the power of the air. And then we are disobedient because before we are saved, we, uh, we are walking in the spirit of disobedience because we've never yet trusted Jesus Christ as Savior. Then in verse 3, we find that we are carnal before we are saved. That is, living according to the flesh. We are corrupt, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And then it says we are condemned because it says we were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. And every one of us who are saved find that before we were saved, those seven conditions were in our lives. If you do not know Jesus Christ as Savior today... Those verses apply to you. You are lost. Yes, dead, depraved, diabolical, disobedient, carnal, corrupt, and condemned. But what does it mean to be lost, in, in other words? Well, to be lost means to be separated from God due to our sinful state at birth. That's a terrible condition. But that's the condition that every one of us have at the point of our birth. And the fact is, of the matter is, we are so lost that we can't save ourselves. You might be religious. You might be a church member. You might have been baptized 34 times forward and 42 times backwards. But if you have not yet, not yet trusted Christ, you're so lost that you cannot save yourself. And this is the condition that every person on the face of the earth experiences at the time of their birth. We are dead in our trespasses and sins. We've all sinned and have come short of the glory of God. Is that your status today? As you look at your life, can you say that I'm in this lost condition, separated from God? Ladies and gentlemen, that's a terrible condition to be in. Dead, depraved, diabolical, disobedient, carnal, corrupt, and condemned. Everyone who has not trusted Christ is in that condition right now. The second condition that we find here is the condition of being saved. Look at verses 4 through 10, and what a glorious change. Verses 1 through 3 are gloomy, but verses 4 through 10 are glorious, where it starts out by saying, But God, but God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us, made us alive together with Christ. By grace are ye saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. You know, there's a lot of hallelujah truth in that particular text. God's mercy, God's grace, God's love, God's riches, God's workmanship. There's so much in there. But in those two verses that are very familiar with us, it says, For by grace God bent over backwards to provide for us a salvation that we do not deserve. For by grace are ye saved, delivered from sin, its power, its penalty, and its presence through faith in Jesus Christ alone. For by grace are ye saved through faith, trusting Christ alone as personal Savior. And that not of yourselves, it, it's, not, it's not something that we can come up with. It is the gift of God, not of works. We can't work with it, lest any man should boast. Think of it, if we could work our way into heaven, wouldn't we write all the boasting papers that we could? How proud we would be. But we can't work our way into heaven. We don't deserve it. We can't earn it. It's a gift of God. What does it mean to be saved? Oh, you've heard this at least once if you've ever attended this church. To be saved means to be delivered from sin. Can you say this with me? 
Let's say what I say every Sunday morning over this pulpit in one way, shape, or form. That salvation means to, say it with me if you know it, be delivered from sin, its power, its penalty, and its presence through faith in Jesus Christ alone. You got it. That's what, that's what it means to be saved. To be delivered from sin, its power, its penalty, and its presence through faith in Jesus Christ alone. This is the condition of every person who has trusted Jesus Christ as Savior. Now, as we look at those two conditions, the condition of being lost, separated from God due to our sinful state at birth, or the condition of being saved, delivered from sin, its power, its penalty, and its presence through faith in Jesus Christ alone. What condition are you in at this very moment? Are you saved and you know it? Or are you lost? If so, admit it. Yesterday I was watching an old movie from Africa. Not the movie out of Africa, that was a movie. But I was watching a movie entitled Solomon's Gold Mines. You ever see it? Good one to watch. Old, old. In search for these mines, I guess that's what they were searching for. I had to take a nap or two in between, but (laughs) those who were looking for the mines got lost in a cave. And uh, not only did they get lost, but their enemies blew up the entrance to the cave that they couldn't get out. Not a good thing to be lost in a cave, is it? And they were holding up a, a, a piece of fire on a stick. You know how they used to look around that way back in the day? And the one fellow said, look, the flame is going that way. There must be a way out of here. And they went over and began to play around with the rocks. And here, pulled this one rock out and it opened up. And then there was a river and they followed that river and it opened up into a very beautiful site in the land of Africa. They were lost. They were in a bad condition. Bound up in that cave. But they found a way out. They removed that rock. They followed that stream. And there they were out in a beautiful site in the beautiful land of Africa. They were lost, but they were found. They were lost and dying in that cave, but they got saved through walking out that door. You get the point. Every person is born on the face of the earth lost in sin. There is a door out of that sinfulness. That door has a name, and that name is Jesus Christ. He said, I am the door. He also said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father, how? But by me. Be honest with yourself this morning. If you're in that lost condition right now, remember that without it, you're, you're going to hell. And I'm going to be talking about that in a minute. I'm bringing the word up now, hell, because if you should die before we get to it, I would encourage you to make the decision right now to trust Christ as Savior, to change your condition from being lost to being saved, so that when you die, you go to be with the Lord in heaven, absent from the body, present with the Lord. Honestly, are you lost or are you saved? Which condition are you in? We go from two conditions to two choices. Turn with me, if you would, please, to Romans chapter 6. Romans, the sixth chapter. And I, I, I just want to read down through this. this. This passage of Scripture has a lot of teaching on soteriology, the whole concept of, of, uh, of, of, of sin and salvation. It, it's all here. And I I just don't have the time to to get into every element of this, but I I want to read verses 16 through 23 and trust that we'll be able to pick up the concept of these two choices. And the choices that we have is the choice of sin or the choice of salvation. The choice of sin or the choice of salvation. Take a look at the Word of God. Romans chapter 6, verse 16. Know ye not? That's another way of saying, don't you know? 
that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Remember that obedience unto righteousness starts by trusting Christ as Savior. Nothing else leads to obedience unto righteousness until you trust Christ as Savior. And again, you're either in the condition of sin unto death or having obeyed Christ, God, and trusted Christ as Savior unto righteousness. You're in one of those two. Then he says, but God be thanked that ye were, speaking to the Romans, you were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and iniquity unto iniquity, even so now your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things, thereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. There is not good fruit from that. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and and, and, and the end everlasting. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You can see there's a lot of teaching in there about sin and salvation. And uh, we just don't have the time to go down through it. The fact of the matter is, though, if you're not saved, then you're living under the power of sin and you cannot please God. If you are saved, you are no longer living under the power of sin, but under the righteousness of Christ to be able to serve Christ. But the point of emphasis is there in that 23rd verse where it says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The two choices. A terrible choice is to choose sin. A tremendous choice is to choose salvation. Up to this point, what choice have you made? Let's look at the choice of choosing sin. Now listen to this carefully. To choose sin means to decide. It's a personal choice now. Now listen to this. Listen, hear me out. Yes, we are born sinners. You agree with that, amen? That's what the Bible says. But listen to this. That... You who are alive and listening to me now and can understand what I'm saying. To choose sin means to decide to continue to live in the sinful state received, yes, at birth, through imputation, transmission, and personal action, and thus being in the state of separation from God. Let me repeat that. To choose sin means to decide, make a decision, to continue to live in the sinful state that you received at birth, through imputation, transmission, and personal action, that is personal sin, and thus being in the state of separation from God. We are all born in sin, right? We've got these three concepts, transmission of sin, excuse me, imputation of sin, transmission of sin, and personal acts of sin. What are they? Well, imputation is the fact that through the sin of Adam, sin has been placed upon the account of everybody in the human race. We are all born sinners because of the sin of Adam. Transmitted sin means that that sin is transmitted down to us, one generation to another generation through our parents. Imputation, sin put on our account. Transmitted sin, sin transmitted to us from one generation to another. When that beautiful baby is born, that baby is born as a sinner through imputation and through through transmission of sin, but then there are the personal acts of sin. You see, we commit sin because we are sinners. You have it? Now here's the point. Some people choose to stay in that sinful state, that sinful position, because they don't receive Christ. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not what? perish but have everlasting life here's the point it's the spirit of God who convicts people of their sin of unbelief amen and so if you have not yet chosen to listen to the spirit of God and trust Jesus Christ as savior you are choosing the concept of living in sin 
Sin as it relates to your personal nature. Sin as it relates to what the Bible calls the old man. Sin that relates to your personal actions of sin. And if you die in that condition, you'll go to hell. But many people under the sound of my voice are choosing to remain there. What choice have you made up to this point in time? I'm talking to people probably in this sanctuary that have, 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 up to this point, have just chosen to stay in sin. You say, Pastor Gary, I haven't chosen to stay in sin. Yeah, but you haven't chosen to trust Christ either, have you? And if you haven't chosen to trust Christ, you've chosen to stay in sin. Did you hear that? I'm speaking to people in hospitals, in, in jails. I know that because we get responses from that. I'm speaking to people in nursing homes. I know that because we are turned on in certain nursing homes. We are speaking to people in stores. I know that because I know of donut shops that have us on right now. And some of you are sitting around and you are watching this program, eating your donut, drinking your coffee, and you've chosen to remain in that sinful condition because you've not yet trusted Christ. Would you right now make the decision for Christ? The choice of sin, a terrible choice. We're born sinners, but we can choose to get out of that through faith in Christ. And that takes us to the choice of salvation, a tremendous choice. And that's to choose salvation means to accept the free gift of eternal life that Christ provided for us in his death, burial, and resurrection. To accept the free gift of eternal life that Christ provided for us in his death, burial, and resurrection. Again, you see it there in verse 23 of Romans 6. For the wages of sin is death. A price has to be paid for Sin, and it is death, separation from God. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Christ died for you on that cross. Have you received that gift? Have you made the choice to appropriate that gift? That gift, that choice, I should say, is available to everybody under the sound of my voice, everybody on the face of the earth. The choice is either to say, Yes to Christ or no to Christ. The choice is to remain dead in trespasses and sins or to receive Christ as Savior. The choice is to be a servant of sin or a servant of Christ. What choice will you make? We go back to, to the cave in looking for Solomon's gold mines. At one particular point, as they were trying to figure out how they were going to get out of this cave that had been closed in, the one guy said, we're without hope. The other person responded and said, yeah, there's, there, there's no way out. But they found that rock, that door. When they removed it, there was a river that led out into the beautiful territory of Africa. What would, have ha what would have happened if they would have chosen to put that rock back up in the hole and stay in that cave? It had died. Right? But they went through that door. They made the right choice to go through that door, and they lived. What are you choosing today? The choice, the terrible choice of staying in your sin, trespasses and sins? Or the choice, the tremendous choice of accepting the free gift of eternal life that Christ provided for you and me in his death, burial, and resurrection. The choice is yours. Nobody else can make it but you. But will you make it? Two conditions, two choices, two consequences. Turn with me, if you would, please, to the book of Luke, chapter 16. Luke, the 16th chapter. This is the story of the rich man and Lazarus. You're familiar with it, are you not? Luke 16. Let me read it. It says, beginning with verse 19. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died 
of being Lazarus. And was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. Say those next three words with me, please. And in hell. Say it again. And in hell he lift up his eyes, beholding in torments, and seeing Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and he said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. And Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed. It's permanent. So that they which would pass hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send home, send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham said unto him, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham. Boy, this guy got evangelistic all of a sudden, didn't he? Nay, Father Abraham. If one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto them, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded. The one rose from the dead. Wish I had time to go down through this and dig into it, which obviously you can see that I don't have the time to do that. But we see two consequences. The consequence of hell and the consequence of heaven. The consequence of hell. What is the consequence of hell? Well, the consequence of hell is the judgment that all those who reject Christ as Savior will experience. Did you get that? Not some, but all. All those that reject Christ as Savior will experience hell. You say, what is hell? I don't know that I believe in it. Well, here's what it is. Hell is the present location of those who have died without Christ. Where there is complete separation from God and anything that is good that will eventually be cast into the eternal lake of fire. See, hell is sort of the holding point for unbelievers. And what that means that the moment that somebody dies without Jesus Christ, right then and there, they will go into hell. The Bible teaches us in Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15, that hell eventually will be cast into the eternal lake of fire, which is the place that those who do not know Jesus Christ as Savior will spend their entire eternity never ever to be able to get out of it. Hell, the present location of those who have died without Christ, where there is complete separation from God and, every, and anything good that will eventually be cast into the eternal lake of fire. Not a good place to be. I want to remind you that there are people there right now because they died without Jesus Christ. What is it that they're experiencing? Well, look at Luke chapter 16 again. There are several things, a number of things. And you know what? It's interesting that Christ spoke more of hell than he did heaven because I think he wanted people to understand what it is so that they could escape it. But look at these things, and I just highlight them as we work our way down through it. First of all, we see that hell is a place of reality. It is real. In verse 23, it says, and in hell. Hell is a real place. Let's not get into the debate where it is. I personally believe that right now it's in the center of the earth. But the fact of the matter is, it is a real place, just like the place that you're in right now. Now, I'm not calling the place that you're in right now hell, you get it? 
I'm just saying that as you are in a place right now that's real, hell is a place that's real. And there are people who do not know Christ there because they chose to stay in their sin. Secondly, we see it's a place of seeing. Verse 23, he says, In hell he lift up his eyes. The ability to see will be there, but I'll tell you something. When you read other passages of Scripture that speak of hell, there's not going to be a lot to look at because it's a place of what? Darkness. People say, well, I'll see all my unsafe friends there. No, you won't. It's dark, and if you did see them, you won't want them around you because you'll be under torment yourself. A place of reality, a place of seeing. It's a place of torment. Again, verse 23. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments. What is interesting about that word torment? It's what? Plural. Which means there are more torments in hell than you and I can even imagine. We can imagine how many torment, uh, torments there is there in hell. Physical. Emotional. Mental. Whatever. It's a terrible place filled with torments. It's a place of reality, a place of seeing, a place of torment. It's a place of crying for mercy. He goes on and says, He seeth Abraham afar off and, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. You want to know something? There are people in hell right now who, not, who never trusted Christ. They've heard the salvation message, but they chose to stay in their sin. Right now, as I speak to you, there are those in hell saying, God, have mercy upon me. But the day of mercy has ended for them. There's no mercy in hell. Because remember, there's nothing, anything good there, including the mercy of God. A place of reality, a place of seeing, a place of torment, a place of crying for mercy. It's a place of fire. Verse 24, And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the, dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I'm tormented in this flame. How, how much, you know, if I want a drink, you know, I'll take a big old drink. And for those of you in radio, I just had a big drink of water. But you tell me, if you're thirsty, what does a little bit of water on the tip of your finger do? Hardly anything at all. But hell is so much torments, so much filled with flame that all that people are asking for today is somebody to touch their finger in water and put it on their tongue. That's terrible. Place of fire. It's a place of remembrance. Verse 25, Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things and likewise Lazarus, evil things. It is a place of remember. You know what? There are people in hell right now, I believe, remembering the many times they heard the plan of salvation but rejected it. The many times they had the choice to receive Christ, but they chose to stay in their sin. And they will wish that they had that to do over again, but there are no second chances in hell. You're there to stay. It's a place of separation. He goes on and he says, but now he's comforted and now we're tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that uh, which would come from thence. There's, it's a place of separation. I mean, there's a great gulf fixed. Yes, indeed. Once you're in hell, you're there to stay. Oh, yeah, you'll come before the great white throne judgment, but only to be cast into the eternal lake of fire. Forever and ever. Never get out of that. 
But it's also a place of desired evangelism. It's interesting. It says, Then he, that is the rich man, said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. (laughs) There are people down in hell today saying, I wish I could get back and talk to my son. I wish I could get back and talk to my daughter, my friend, my relative. But there are no evangelistic efforts there that's going to be fulfilled. Nobody can come back and tell you how bad hell is so that you'll reject it through faith in Christ. You've got to believe the word of God. If you would have died last night, would you be in heaven or hell today? Consequence of hell comes by not accepting Christ as personal Savior. But there's the other consequence of heaven. Hell is a terrible consequence, but heaven is a tremendous consequence. And even as hell is a real place, so is heaven. The consequence of heaven is the bliss all those who receive Christ as Savior will experience. As, as, as a matter of fact, heaven is the present location of those who have died in Christ where there is sweet fellowship with God and everything good in which true believers will live in joy and blessing for all of eternity. Lila's there. Stan's there. Many of our friends and relatives are there. A present location of those who've died in Christ where there is sweet fellowship with God and everything good in which true believers will live in joy and blessing for eternity. Where do you want to spend eternity? In hell? That's going to be cast into the lake of fire? Do you want to spend eternity there? Where there is nothing good? Torments? Or do you want to spend eternity in sweet fellowship with God and everything good in which true believers will live in joy and blessing for all of eternity. It's interesting, the contrast that's made there in verse 25. Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted. Abraham's bosom in those days... uh, in hell, we're probably in the same paradise. In hell, we're probably in the same location and separated by this great gulf. When Jesus Christ ascended and went up into heaven, he took paradise home to be with him in heaven. An interesting study on your own. But the fact of the matter is that the rich man was in torment in hell. Abraham, I mean, Lazarus was in Abraham's bosom in comfort. Today, those who die without Christ go immediately to hell, torment. Those who die in Christ go immediately to be with the Lord, absent from the body, present with the Lord. What choice will you make? If you'd have died last night, where would you be this morning? Some of you have gotten to the point where you've almost trusted Christ, haven't you? But you haven't. P.P. Bliss wrote a song entitled Almost Persuaded. Hymn number 309 in our book. I'm not going to sing it, but I'm going to read it to you. If you want to follow the words, you may. Almost persuaded now to believe. Almost persuaded Christ to receive. Seems now some soul to say, Go, Spirit, go thy way. Spirit, don't convict me anymore. Come some more convenient day, and then I'll, on thee I'll call. Almost persuaded. Come. Come today. Almost persuaded. Turn not away. Jesus invites you here. Angels are lingering near. Prayers rise from hearts so dear. People are praying for you. Oh, wanderer, come. Come. Come now. Come today. Almost persuaded. Harvest is past. Almost persuaded. Doom comes at last. Almost cannot avail. Almost is but to fail. Sad, sad this bitter wail in hell. 
Almost, but lost. How many people are in hell right now where they were almost ready to receive Christ, but they chose to continue to re- live in sin rather than to choose to receive Christ? Right now they're in hell saying, I wish I would have said yes to Jesus Christ. Almost saved. Delivered from sin, its power, its penalty, and its presence through faith in Jesus Christ, but eternally lost because they chose to stay in sin. Does this get to your heart? Two conditions. Being lost, separated from God due to our sinful state of birth. Being saved. Delivered from sin, its power, its penalty, and its presence through faith in Jesus Christ alone. Two choices. The choice of sin. Deciding to continue to live in sin, the sinful state received through imputation, transmission, and personal action, and thus being in the state of separation from God. Or the choice of salvation, accepting the free gift of eternal life that Christ provided for us through his death, burial, and resurrection. The consequence of hell, that present location of those who have died without Christ where there is complete separation from God and anything good that will eventually be cast into the eternal lake of fire or the consequence of heaven, the present location of those who have died in Christ where there is sweet fellowship with God and everything good in which true believers will live in joy and blessing for all of eternity. At this present time, Three questions. Number one, what is your condition? Be honest with yourself. Are you lost or are you saved? Number two, what has been your choice? Have you chosen to stay in sin or have you chosen salvation through faith in Christ? Number three, what will be your consequence? Hell or heaven? How many of you can say without a doubt today, if you'd have died last night, you would be in heaven this morning. If you can say that without a doubt, say amen. Amen. Some of you couldn't say that. You know what you need to do right now? Receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. Today, you can seal your eternal destiny, heaven or hell, by your choice. If you're here today and you're the sound of my voice, I believe that if you're yet lost, the Spirit of God is convicting you of your unbelief. What choice will you make to receive Christ or to reject Him? If you're joining us by way of media ministries, right there by the radio, the TV, the computer, whatever the case may be, If you've not yet trusted Christ, I would encourage you to call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. Because you see, the Savior is waiting to enter into your heart. Will you give him that entrance by saying, yes, Lord Jesus, I trust you to save me. Call upon the name of the Lord right there by that piece, that device to which you're listening to this message. And then call us or contact us here at the church and we will send you information that will help you to get started right with your walk with the Lord. There's a song entitled, The Savior is Waiting to Enter Your Heart. In this sanctuary, close your eyes and listen to these words by Media Ministries. Listen to this as we leave the air today. The Savior is waiting to enter your heart. (laughs) 